Pops, no little U's, no T's. Everybody is big in this ministry. Everybody counts in this ministry. Everybody's assignment has to be unto God. I, I know that you sometimes want to get your shine on, but, but let me tell you something. Come a little closer. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's about the person that's sitting next to you. It's about the person in your neighborhood that asked you to pray for them last month and you forgot. It's about the person that you went to see at the hospital that, that needed to hear the kind word that you gave. Bump, bump. Blow your own horn. Get out the way of yourself and let God be mighty. Let God be glorious. Give him the hallelujah that he deserves. Because I don't know about how you find it, but I know had it not been, but I know, but I know had it not been, you may see this little short man dressed up in the suit this morning, but if you knew the story, you stand up and start praising for me if you knew the story. You'd give him some praise and you'd just simply say, Lord, I thank you for doing it for him. I can praise you for doing it for my brother and my sister. I can praise you because I know, uh, Deacon Edwards, if, if you coming down the streets with blessing, <laughs> I know I live on the same streets you live on. So, so I'm not worried about, I'm not going to try to get in front of you. I ain't going to try to snatch it out of the ground. I'm going to celebrate you and tell you, Lord, thank you for doing For turning their children around. Turning their household around. Thank you, Lord. Because I rest assured that you're in my neighborhood. And you're coming my way. I'm just going to stand, hold my peace, continue to speak, not against your life, but into your life, and tell the Lord, continue to open up the windows of heaven, pour them out blessings that he shall not have room enough to receive. But you know what I know? The God I serve is bigger than us. When he pour your neighbor a blessing, sometimes it's so big, it'll hold, it'll flow over to your house, over to your children. It, your, your car even start now, and you didn't know why. That's what I know about the God I serve, that he is worthy of our praise. How we honor him this morning, and how we glorify him how we just thank him for his goodness. You ever get to the point where you don't have to have a reason? When you just got a genuine, a genuine thank you. A genuine thank you. For what? Not he did for you, but for what he didn't let happen to you. Sometimes you just got to think back on the things, the seen and unseen danger that he kept you out of. And, and he directed you around and, and by. Sometimes you just got to say, thank you, God, for uh, uh, allowing me to give you praise for the protection you gave unto me even when I couldn't see it. I didn't even know I was in harm's way on last evening, but because of you, because of you. Here I am this morning to tell somebody that I'm going to celebrate with you in the land of the living. In the land of the living. In the land of the living. We can celebrate each other. Yeah. Honor and power. We give God praise this morning. Well, 
Let me call your attention to the gospel of Luke this morning. It's a good time to plant this morning, Reverend. It's, it's already been tilled, the soil has been broken up. Already been dissed up. I believe it's time to, to throw a few seeds here and there. Luke, the 13th chapter, verse number 18, very familiar passage of scripture this morning. Luke 13, I'm going to commence reading at verse number 18. Are we there this morning? Amen. The Bible says, then said he, unto what is the kingdom of God like, and whereunto shall I resemble it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and cast into his garden, and it grew, and waxed a great tree, and the files of the air lodged in the branches of it. And again he said, Whereunto shall I liken the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole uh, was leaven. Verse number 22 says, And he went through the city, the cities and villages teaching and journeying, journeying toward Jerusalem. Can I have about 20 minutes of your undivided attention this morning and speak from the thought, my seed has to win. My seed has to win. You know, when we think about the kingdom influence that we have, if we understood the power that we have in the seed that we are in possession of. We see the symbolic meaning of harvest in scripture encompass two main areas, God's provision for us and God's blessing for others. While we celebrate harvest season just once a year, yet we experience the spirit of harvest each day, all day, and every day. Each day we go to our jobs and earn a paycheck. We experience harvest. Each time uh, we, we receive love from our family and those uh, uh, in our families, we receive and experience harvest. Each time we experience the closeness of God in a way that feels us spiritually, we experience harvest. Anytime we are filled, we experience harvest. Harvest then isn't something that we experience once a year, but something we experience on a daily basis. You see, there is, this is where Jesus, the words of Jesus are so important. The harvest we experience on a daily basis don't actually belong to us. They belong to God because he is the Lord of the harvest. Not us. Uh, so when we put God in his rightful place, then we understand that we are mere uh, croppers in a field that we have just been given right passage to. You see, we, we recognize him as the Lord of, of, of the harvest. We recognize that he is the one who gave us hands to work the harvest. Uh, the eyes to see the harvest, uh, feelings to, to, to have empathy in the harvest, uh, uh, that, 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 that he is the one that supplies all of the, uh, the provisions for the harvest. Uh, so so in, in light of that, we recognize the Lord of the harvest for who he is in our lives. We embrace the fact that in part, our harvest is something that he gives us to meet our needs. Watch this. It also is something that he wants us to bless others with. You see, just like a physical growth, uh, uh, just like the physical growth of a field, the spiritual growth of people is a natural, organic process overseen by God himself. If we don't see anything getting saved, we don't see things changing, we have a tendency uh, to start to backpedal and start to lose heart and start to lose emotions, but I just came by this morning to encourage you. What we need to remember, that sowing is just as important as reaping. And just because I'm a sower doesn't mean I'm going to see the harvest. 
Uh, it, it doesn't mean that I'm going to uh, uh, be, be a witness to what I've dropped in the ground. It, it doesn't mean that uh, it's incumbent upon God to show me what it is that he's done for me in, through, and with me. It, it's not incumbent upon that. It is incumbent upon me understanding the mere fact that I am a sower in this season and there has to be and there will be reapers and it may not even be me. So, uh, so some of us are our sowers and may never result the labor of our, see the labor of our harvest. That's why our focus should be on pleasing the one who sent us into the field rather than controlling the rate of growth, the measure of growth, or the amount of growth that we think ought to come from the seed we harvest. You see, we get to the point where we feel as though sometimes when we labor hard enough, then there just has to be some results that I see right now. The devil is a liar because uh, sowers uh, have the mindset that my job is to sow. My job is to sow. I'm going to sow it no matter what the reaping. The reaping part of it is not mine. The sowing part of it is mine. My mindset is, here it is, this seed in my hand is going to grow something. I may not see it, but I know it's going to grow something. That's my mindset. Reaping is not even on my mind because my sowing spirit and assignment says, I know my assignment. And my assignment says... That when I drop this seed, something is going to grow, whether I witness it or not. The two parables in our text this morning here is here to encourage us who serve the Lord Jesus Christ by his real and simple truth. Can I just go ahead and speak into your, your, your spirit this morning and tell you that his side is going to win. His side is going to win. So uh, what I am saying to you this morning that you all are already winners. The mustard seed grew. The mustard seed will grow into a tree with the birds nesting in its branches. The leaven will spread throughout the whole lump. The kingdom of the world shall become the kingdom of our Lord and Christ Jesus, and he will reign forever. Luke links these two parables to the preceding context with the word, therefore. You see, Jesus was facing opposition and, and rejection from the Jewish religious leaders. Can I just set the stage? You see, if you will, will you allow your sanctified imagination to go uh, back to that time so that we can understand uh, what the disciples must have been feeling? You see, they had left their businesses and, and, and their way of life to stake everything on the fact that this young carpenter turned preacher was none other than God's anointed one, the Messiah. He, he didn't look like what everyone expected him uh, to look like. He didn't look like the Messiah. He, he wasn't born uh, to, to nobility. He, he didn't have connections with the religious leaders in Jerusalem. He had not been educated in their schools. He had not had no pedigree of the worldly sense of the term. You see, but his powerful teaching and, and the miracles he performed had convinced these men that he was the one. You, you see, when you understand that you are the one and this seed in your hand is going to produce something, you can be convinced, sold out, that when I drop it, something's going to come up. You can be convinced of that. You can be sold out about that. The disciples here, they were not going... Uh, and looking at uh, what the expectations were of the people, uh, they expected him to inaugurate the kingdom by overthrowing the Roman rule and establish the throne of David again in Jerusalem. But herein lies the problem. Things were not going uh, according to the disciples' expectation. You know how sometimes uh, you labor and you labor and you labor and, and there's no evidence of you laboring. Uh, sometimes you can get uh, discouraged about what you're doing and, and how you're doing it. The religious leaders were not lining up on Jesus' side. In fact, they were growing increasingly hostile. Rather than try to win them over, here, here, this is for somebody today, rather than try to win them over, Jesus boldly confronted them by calling them hypocrites. Uh, they were being humiliated. Uh, the disciples must have looked at this and thought, we must be crazy in ourselves to leave our jobs, 
leave our families and go follow a man that's going to go against the grain, that's going to kick the prick. And all of these people are saying one thing and are against him, but here he is standing boldly and declaring the kingdom of God. We've got to be out of our mind to think that these seeds we have in our hand is going to produce something in this field, in this crop. Jesus said to them, just hold your robe. And my daddy used to say, just hold what you got. You see, as the men who lack education and sophistication, the disciples were looking at the religious leaders with all of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the exterior stuff and with all of the, the, the protege and the talk. You see, they had the right talk. They had the right walk, but they had the wrong heart. You see, he wasn't looking at, Jesus wasn't looking at what they had externally. Jesus understood that the way things seemed, and, and seem to be growing even more discouraging, now is the time for us to dig in even greater. New birth, here's your shout this morning. The two parables shows them and proves to us, in spite of small and seemingly insignificant beginnings, the gospel will always prevail. If you don't know nothing else today, I want you to leave here with that thought in your mind. The gospel will always prevail. Even though there is conflict and the task seem and seemingly to be overwhelming, God's purpose through Jesus will triumph in, in, in and over every situation and every circumstance. Thus reasoning the fact this morning that your seed, my seed, it has to win. It, it has to win. It has no choice but to win. It will win, but you have to have the bold confidence to be able to declare the seed that you have, you know for yourself that you've got a winner in your hand. Church, let me throw it at you this morning for free this one. You want to be on Jesus' side because ultimately, ultimately, he will triumph over everything. Although there are uh, some differences in our text this morning, the parables are one and the same. The ultimate uh, seed here and sense of the seed is to win, win the kingdom of God. And, and he will triumph. Watch the text. A little seed could produce this unusual large shrub. So large that the birds would be able to find shelter. We're talking about the mustard seed. May I suggest to you this morning first, Jesus will triumph over and in everything by just throwing the seed of the gospel this morning. If you will just take it in and of yourself to just throw the gospel this morning, I, I promise you, get, Jesus will give your tree to grow large enough that something will land in it. Something will land in it. You, you see, the man took the seed, watch the text, and he threw it into his own garden. As the parable would have it, the seed represents the word of God. The parable reasons the fact that the man, first of all, had a garden. And he had a desire to reap a crop. Sadly, many professing believers throughout life go through life without the concept that the Lord has given you a corner in the field. Come a little closer this morning. Each of you sitting here this morning has a corner in the field. Each of you this morning has seed in your hand and in your heart. So, so don't think that you're not uh, uh, significant this morning. Your corner counts as great as the next man's corner. Church, you don't know in this garden are those people that has been purposed for you to hear, for them to hear your voice and for you to hear their voice. God has assigned them to you and you to them. I know that sounds crazy this morning, but watch this. Please, beloved, do understand and accept the fact Soars are crop producers of God. He is the landowner to whom we all must give an account to. I, I know that it's your seed, but the harvest don't belong to you. You see, you can't just hold on to the seed that you're in possession of for yourself. Uh, you can't just keep it because you don't want to lose the seed. The garden consists of people with whom you have con contact with to influence for the sake of God's kingdom. Watch this, whether you embrace it or not, if you are a blood-washed believer this morning, you have been given a corner in God's field. You have been given a corner in God's field. 
You should desire to see God use you to produce a harvest in him in the garden that you're tending to. Watch me this morning. The way to produce crop is to be planters, a sower of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The man threw the seed into the garden. Until he did that, until desire, destiny, and divine purpose had a head on collision, there could be no sprout from the seed starting to grow. You see, it does you no good. It did him no good to hold what he had in his hand and to hold what he had in his heart. You see, you can't go to the nursery, buy a package of seed, take them home, and set them on the shelf without intent, without desire, without anticipation, without expectation that the seed you have in your possession cannot yield on your shelf. I wish it could, but it's not that easy. It, it doesn't work that way. Uh, the package tells you that these seeds will produce tomatoes within so many weeks, right? So you wait, but the time goes by, and you don't see anything happening to the tomato packet on the shelf. Uh, you go back to the nursery, and you complain that the seed that you sold me don't produce a crop. Uh, the nursery asks, uh, uh, but what time, uh, what time has passed by? Uh, did you plant the season? Did you plant the seed? When did you plant the seed? The reaction was plant them. Yes, plant them. You do know that you have to put the seed in the ground for the seed to grow. It, it won't work sitting there on your shelf. It has to be planted so there can be some harvest. There is so much in the seed that will produce without, the seed will not produce anything without it being planted this morning. And the gospel will have no effect until it comes in contact with a sinner. You see, you and I cannot afford to walk around when, with all of this gospel in our heart. Uh, we cannot afford to walk around with our Bibles talked, tucked tightly up under our arms, thinking that uh, what I look like and how I look is going to move somebody. The devil is a liar. Until you and I begin to drop the seed of the gospel, there can be no harvest. If you want to reap a crop, you must sow the seed of the gospel into the hearts of sinners. The man that sowed the seed, the plain seed, watch the text. He didn't wrap it in gold leaves. <laughs> watch this. He, he, he didn't dress it up in any other manner. The text does not indicate uh, anything other than he took a bare seed and had bare soil, and every crop producer knows this though, you have to work the field before the seed will grow. Uh, uh, the, the text says he threw the, the seed onto the ground, but what the text doesn't tell you is uh, this was his garden. You cannot have a garden without working a garden. So, so when he threw the seed on the ground, the Bible gives us to understand the parable is that he's already been working in the soil, so he had expectations that this seed was going to produce a crop. But wait a minute, don't miss it. He didn't take anything special. He, he didn't have to hocus pocus it. He, he didn't have to make a nursery rhyme with it. The Bible says the plain seed and plain soil, when they come into contact with each other, that's all that needs to happen. You see, what am I trying to tell you this morning? I'm just trying to simply tell you that you don't have to add anything or take anything away from the gospel. The gospel has in it everything that it already needs. If you will just take it, plant it, I promise you, God will do the rest. The crop producers is well aware of the fact there has to be a time we break up the soil. And sometimes we even have to break out I wish Daddy Edwards was here this morning, the buster, because some ground are harder than others. You do understand, come a little closer this morning, that sometimes you have to work this ground harder than you have to work this ground. Uh, sometimes you have to stay a little longer in this ground than you did in this ground. Uh, sometimes you have to understand that as a crop producer, as a sower, that my goal, my intent, my sole focus is to make sure that I get this seed in the ground. I know that it's hard today. I, I know that I've got to, to continue to stay right here. I was here last week. I was here the week before. But guess what? I'm going back again this week. Why? Because I've got to take the buster this week. 
I've got to tell the world this week that Jesus is the reason. I know going back that my intent has already won. I know that because the crop producer is well aware that when I give the seed room to grow, when I plow the field, when I till the soil, uh, the crop producer knows with an expectation and anticipation that something is getting ready to come out of the ground. Right. You see, uh, but I, I don't have to embellish the word. I just have to tell them the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, I don't have to have brilliant ideas. I don't have to have persuasive techniques. I, I don't have to have glamour and glitter because here it is, the power of salvation is not in my technique, it's in the seed. The seed has everything that it needs to produce the crop that you're yielding. The gospel is the power of God to salvation, the gospel of Jesus Christ. All we need to do is present the gospel, to be clear about the gospel, to present the gospel with clarity. I don't have to make any promises to anybody about the gospel. I don't have to tell them that if they sow this week, they're going to get a new house next week. I don't have to tell them that if they do this, they're going to do that. The devil is a liar. All I have to do is give the word in context, in season, and give it the way God has given us to give it, and then God will do the rest. Here I come for you this morning. I may have missed you in order to welcome the good news of the gospel. People must be convinced of the bad news of their condition before, ho before a holy God. You see, we, we've gotten to the point that uh, we sometimes want to take a back seat to the real issue at hand. Sin is sin. I don't care how you dress it up, it's what it is. Uh, it's how you look at it, I don't care how you look at it, you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. And so you, you and I cannot afford to try to make the gospel uh, fit the condition that it is. The gospel has already fit the condition that needs to be fit. It's already purpose for that very condition. How you know, preacher? Because it brought you out. It saved you. It did it for you. That's how I know it's already purpose. Because it did it for you. It reached way down and brought you out of the miry clay. It reached way back and brought you out of this and out of that. I know now you look all good and shined up, but there was a time in your life that the gospel did it for you and all you needed was the gospel of Jesus Christ. It wasn't watered down. It wasn't fed to you on a gold spoon. It wasn't given to you with a, a, a bow on it. It was presented as the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if it had the power to bring you out of yours, it's got the power for you to take it to bring the next man out. You don't need to add nothing. I know you ain't got your church clothes on today. What that got to do with dropping a seed? I know you don't have your Bible. Today. What that's got to do with dropping a seed? I know the environment is not right. They drinking and smoking. What that's got to do with dropping the seed? Has nothing to do with dropping the seed. But we want to make the seed convenient for the ailment. Not understanding that it's already been purposed, shaped for the very thing that's needed, and all you've got to do is drop it. That's it. So what you're holding in your hand, if you realize the power that you have in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you would be convicted not to just drop it just like it is. You don't need to add anything or take anything away. Some of us may be better persons than others. But the true fact is none, is none of us can ever qualify for heaven by our righteousness, our goodness. To try to enter God's holy presence through our own righteousness would be like flying into the sun. We will be consumed instantly. Watch this. We, <laughs> against the backdrop of bad news, the good news is the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins and the sinners that have yet to come. We can receive him as Savior and Lord through faith. We should sow, watch this, the simple seed with our children, with our family members, with our friends, with our acquaintances, with strangers, wherever we see it. Uh, we, 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 when we get the opportunity to, to sow a seed, we should sow the seed of the gospel. We need to make sure we're sowing the seed itself, though, church. <laughs> Uh, you don't have to camouflage it. 
uh, so, so it won't be offensive. Uh, the, the, the doctrine of self-esteem has flooded into the church. I'm going somewhere. Jesus can help you be all that you can be, all that you want to be. He, he can help you achieve your dream. Don't worry about repentance. Just try Jesus and you'll be happy. But that's not the gospel, and it won't save sinners. I hate to tell you that this morning. The gospel is what saved sinners. It is what's going to save our nation. It is the result of moral re reformation. Moral reformation without the gospel is like trying to put tux a tuxedo on a pig. It may dress the pig up, and he may look nice for a moment, but, but it, it won't be a lasting change. Jesus will triumph through the seeding and sowing of the gospel, and that's what we need to focus on. That's what we need to focus on and how we need to focus on it. The sown seed of the gospel will powerfully accomplish its intended result. The power in the seed, the power of the seed is life. Put the seed into the ground, and life, the life in it will produce the mighty tree. You see, there had to be something bigger in the seed than the seed itself. We're talking about a mustard seed. Uh, 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 just imagine that this, this tiny mustard seed has, has in it a, a tree that can come out of it. But, but until it is planted, it's just a mustard seed that looks like it has no value. Uh, it has no weight to it. It has no power to it. But until it comes in contact with the soil, then, only then, can it produce what it is that's supposed to be produced. It would be nice for us to be able to just hold on to the seed. I'm sorry to tell you today, uh, it won't work. There was no glory, watch this, to the man who sowed the seed. We don't know his name even in the text. The text doesn't even give us his name. Uh, but watch this. Uh, he, he didn't do anything spectacular. He didn't do anything heroic. Uh, the power was not in him or in any slick way that he put the seed into the ground. The power was in him understanding that he had a corner in the garden to plant and that he had a seed that will produce a crop. Do I know what the crop was going to be? No. My job was to just plant the seed. Why? Because I'm looking for a harvest. I'm looking for a harvest. I don't know how many trees it's going to produce. That wasn't his concern. The Bible gives us to understand that he wasn't worried about what the seed was going to produce, but what he knew is, is that this corner of the field, this garden, that he was in possession of, he knew that the seed that he was in possession of was going to yield a crop. It, it wasn't up to him to say how large or how small, how significant, how insignificant. It was up to him to make sure that he sowed the seed. He had taken, of course, no, 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 no credit for a proper technique of planting. Planting the gospel of Jesus Christ is the technique in itself. And that is simply us giving, giving scripture in context, giving scripture uh, line upon line, precept upon precept. He had no particular planting order that gave him the crop. New Birth says, I get ready to close this morning. He may have watered it and protected it from the elements and fertilized it, but he had nothing to do with making the seed grow. The seed grew because life within it was already there before he put it out. You, you see, the seed grew because life came in contact with Lord. And, and the man could do nothing else except for marvel at this big tree that's come about from this little mysterious seed of life that came in contact with the Lord. You, you see, the church uh, has to understand that the size of the task it's not proportionate to the smallness of the force, and it doesn't hinder the seed. Jesus will triumph. The text give us to understand that the woman, even with the three measures of flour that were equal to 50 pounds, leaven or yeast 
is a single cell fungus that promotes fermentation. Watch this. When you put it into bread, it produces carbon monoxide bubbles that causes dough to rise. Watch this. The leaven must come in contact with the dough for the power to be unleashed in the seed. You see, once uh, it has come in contact and made contact with it, the power is unstoppable. You can't, reserve, you can't reverse it. You can't turn it back. You can't pat it down. When, the, when it comes into contact with the left, it is going to rise, and you can't do nothing about it. All you did was say, I planted it, because now you have no control over uh, how big it's going to get, how wide it's going to spread. Uh, once the gospel penetrates the heart of those who hear the gospel, it will effectually bring them unto salvation. It will rise. It will do what it's been designed to do. And all you've got to do is be the leaven or the yeast in a dying world and watch the Jesus do the rest. If you want to be somebody, be leaven today. Step into somebody's life. Drop a seed that will continue now to grow and to rise and to get bigger than you ever thought it was going to be. Here's how I know. You didn't think Pookie could be saved, but you just dropped a seed and now he's saved. You didn't think Ray Ray was going to be a preacher, but you just dropped a seed and now he's a preacher. You didn't think uh, Jeremiah was going to be a musician, but now he's a musician. Why? Because you've just dropped the seed. It's not incumbent upon you and I. Our job is to be the lesson. And when the gospel comes into contact with the mass of humanity, it's unstoppable. It's irreversible. New birth, can I tell you this morning? If each of us in this room was leaven, leaven in bread has no restrictions. I'm going. If each of us here was leaven, we all went down a different street in our community. Y'all already got it. And we just began to open our mouths. And the gospel begins to be planted. Remember, you're the leaven. You, you dropped it right here on this street, in this household. But you have moved on from this household. You're around the corner now on the block. And now you look back across the house and you see everything, all this chaos happening. You see now that a house uh, now is being saved because of the leaven that you dropped in that particular house. Now the mother and the father and the children now are beginning to be saved and have salvation. And all you did was drop leaven in that one place. But imagine if you had leaven and you had leaven and you had leaven and we all dropped leaven everywhere we went. It's unreversible. It's unstoppable everything then has to come into contact with Jesus Christ you, you see when we drop it my job is not to worry about how out of control it's going to get uh, because now I dropped it and my son's son now is in church with me I dropped it and now my son's baby mama is in church with me yeah we still just sharing custody but we got one thing in common and that's the Lord Jesus Christ why? because you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ when you and I remember the Bible doesn't say how small the portion of leaven was. But it does say, in proportionate to the three measures were 50 pounds. Gives me to know and understand contextually that it's never based on the amount of measure. It's always based on the amount of heart that the leaven has. It did depend on the leaven. I mean, the, the measure, it depended on the leaven. What I know about Jesus is this. When you bring the word into contact with that person that has a heart and a desire, and sometimes not even not, and when you drop a seed, when you drop it, and you genuinely give them the unadulterated 
gospel of Jesus Christ. You can take now your job and move on to the next. Don't give yourself no credit. Don't pat yourself on the back. Don't have no party because you told somebody what the scripture said. Because remember, that corner of your field has more than just that person in it. Do you not know your field's got your children attached to it, your children's children, the next generation attached to it? And then your corner of the field have someone that you don't even know that their generations are attached to it. So you can't think about when you drop it. I know we get weary sometimes. I understand it. I know. But I tell you this. If you will not back down from the size in proportion to all the problems and chaos we seem to have, if you, just you, will begin to know that you are the living for everything that is attached to you, change will come. Don't worry about the assignment you seem that may be seemingly larger than you. It may be too big for you. Don't let the enemy tell you that this community can't be turned around or, or we're going to give up on this child. The devil is a liar. Because I promise you this, and I can go on record, if you don't back down with the gospel, the gospel won't let you down. <laughs> it won't let you down. It will be everything that you need. In spite of the fight that you have to go through just to sometimes plan it. Just to sometimes to get a word in. Edge wise. I know. But you have to understand, and I have to understand, that your seed is already won. Jesus has already given it everything that it needs. He just needs some planters. He just needs some people that will take their portion of the garden that has already been given unto you since before you was formed in your mother's womb. And now be able to labor in that. I know what you're thinking. It's a massive problem, yes. But you are a small part of a big solution. So I don't mind being my small part. Notice that the Bible doesn't give him to have had the field. It gives him a garden. The field is Jesus. So if you'll take your garden, your portion of it, and you'll work that portion, God will work the field. Can you imagine? Ah, I'm done. In the field. Everybody is working. If you plowing this season. I'm reaping this season. But guess what? We all in the field. And, 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 and because I, I, I'm sowing and you're reaping, I look over there and, 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 and tell you, I, my, my, look, I, let me come over and help you reap your harvest. And you'll come over and help me sow in my harvest. Uh, but, but, but we're in the same field. I've got my portion. You've got your portion. And we're working the same mindset that I'm expecting a harvest and you're reaping the harvest that you've already planted. But it's in the field. You don't control his harvest. He doesn't control your harvest. But you're in the same field. You've got your corner. If you will work yours, God will work the field. He'll tend to the field. You may need to borrow my plow breaker this year. Yours is a little hard. Brother, let's yoke up and pray. Let's touch and agree. Let's call those things that are not as though they are. Let's tell this mountain that it shall move. It has to move. Yes, you can borrow my breaker. I'm going to lay before the altar with you. I I'm going to be your prayer partner for this season. We're going to touch and agree. We're going to call on the name of Jesus. My breaker will help you bust your ground. We're in the same field. Will you help me? Will you help me? <laughs> so, reap. The harvest belongs to God. Facebook family and friends, thank you for joining in live with us. Let us say to you that if you do not know Jesus in the part of your sins, would you please go to nbbcshreveport.org 
and allow us to introduce you to Christ Jesus. Allow us to give you to understand that you've already won. I know it may not seem like it right now, but if you had not given your life to Christ, please allow us the opportunity to introduce you to Christ through the gospel of Jesus Christ. NBBCShreveport.org. Thank you. I'm done, church. Can I say to you this morning,